All right, thank you guys. Boy, that is so tremendous. I love every bit of that. Oh my goodness. How many of you were brought up on the old hymns? I say the old hymn. They're the hymns. <laughs> we were, weren't we? Boy, we cut our teeth on that. And uh, they spoke to us, speak to us, still do. Mm. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains, lose all. And there's victory in Jesus. <laughs> if we ever sing victory in Jesus, y'all watch out. Rick's going to have a fit. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> Not made it through it one time since you guys said. Because there is victory in Jesus. Jesus is our victory. He really is. And I've been trying to share that with you over the last uh, five weeks. So, well, actually, this is the fifth week of our series that we're in um, concerning unmasking the enemy. And I started this series because uh, I felt that it was important for us in these days. These are the most evil days. I, I, and I know I don't have to tell you that. These are the most evil days. And I, I you know, I lived through the 60s and the 70s. And, I, you know, after that, it was just kind of bubbles here and there. But the 60s was terrible, man. The 60s in the late 60s with the Vietnam War and all the hippies and yippies and yuppies and, and, the, and the protest and the drugs and the sex and the dance, you know, every, all of that, all of that going on over, over our nation. But... Uh, <laughs> And I, I know any rebellion is rebellion, but it just seems now that this rebellion that we're in now is just, it has a deeper intent. It just has a, um, it has a destructive intent uh, to it and to destroy our nation, destroy, and to come against God and the truth of God and the word of God, the people of God. And uh, I tried to share a little bit last week about that when I talked to you about uh, the Antichrist, which is one of the five names of the devil that I've chosen to amplify so that we could see, all right, by seeing their name, we can see their character because they have certain names because of their character. Their names express a character. And their character will tell you how they operate and function and if you know how they operate and function, then you're going to be, you're going to have a great advantage at fighting the enemy and defeating the enemy and living the life that God has designed for you to live. Because make no mistake about it, the purpose of the enemy is to stop you from living the life and being the person that God created you to be when he formed you in your mother's womb. Lucifer, you remember the first message about Lucifer. What was Lucifer's problem? Lucifer's problem was pride. The original sin of humanity or the original sin of the, of the universe was pride when Lucifer rebelled against God in heaven. And so how do we defeat pride? Well, we defeat pride with the ultimate humility. And the ultimate humility is worship is to exalt God, to, 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 to praise an almighty God with all you have, to worship him, to lower yourself and exalt him. And then we saw Satan, Satanos, which sounds almost like a, a Spanish word, but it, in Greek, Satanos means uh, uh, one who opposes our adversary. And you remember how, the, our, how Satan, our adversary, opposes. The scripture says that he is a liar, and that in him is not any truth at all. Everything he says to you is a lie. He opposes the word of God. He opposes the truth of God. He is our adversary. And so how do we defeat Satan? We defeat Satan by using the word of God to defeat him just like Jesus did. Jesus came off of a 40-day fast taken into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He was weak, emaciated in his physical body, and yet G the enemy comes against him in full force. And what did Jesus do? Jesus quoted three verses out of the book of Deuteronomy. I bet most of us probably couldn't even find Deuteronomy in the Bible. If I said, turn to Deuteronomy, you'd be looking in the content. Jesus took three obscure verses out of the book of Deuteronomy and tore Satan up. So we saw Satan, and then we saw the devil. The devil is diablos in Greek, and it means the accuser or the slanderer. And this is the aspect of Satan that tries to destroy relationships, especially your relationship with God. 
but he tries to kill any meaningful, purposeful, God-honoring relationship in our life with slander and accusations. And how do we defeat him? We defeat him by not letting the sun go down on our wrath, not allowing him to whisper accusatory things and slanderous things into our life to fight that. And then we saw last week the Antichrist. And the Antichrist, and I said, I would like for you to remember one word when you leave here today. If you don't remember, well, I want you to remember everything. But if you didn't remember everything, the one word, you remember the one word I said I want you to remember? Deception. The Antichrist is the deceiver. The earth is in mass deception today. You, you look at it and you go, how in the world can people believe that and think that and do that and be that? Well, they're deceived because the Antichrist is the deceiver. The word Antichrist, actual the word Antichrist is only used four times in the Bible. It's used by John all in the book of 1 John. But his description is used over 38 times in the, in the scripture, many places, Old Testament and New, New Testament. The, uh, the Antichrist is anti in the Greek language. The prefix anti means to oppose and replace. Not just oppose, not just come against, not to be against like anti, like anti-gravity, but, but to oppose it and replace it. So what does the Antichrist want to do? He wants to op oppose and replace Jesus Christ in, in, in all of our lives. So today now, we're gonna be looking at unmasking the roaring lion. So I wanna want to begin with a couple of scriptures here uh, and kind of get us started in this. I've been studying, by the way, lions for about three weeks now. I might be a little daffy uh, about them. <laughs> I have, I've studied safari films, I've studied uh, I've listened to people give testimonies about safaris they went on, what it was like, what you could expect. They even took cameras and took you on the safari with them and you got to see everything. You can go, man, you can find anything online, I'm serious. And, uh, and, 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 I, and I listened to guides talk about the tendencies of wild animals and lions and all the different things that they look in the, in the uh, African grasslands and so forth and all of that kind of thing and the tendencies of these animals and what these animals do and how you can be around these animals and what you can expect out of these animals and so. Uh, it's been quite interesting to me, and I, I want to share a few things with you that I found. Because, you know, when Jesus says, or well, it's actually Peter says in 1 Peter 5, um, for us to be, to, be, uh, to be sober and be vigilant, because our adversary, the devil, uh, roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Yeah, it, it, there's a reason he calls him the roaring lion. And it's because the characteristics of Satan, the devil, Lucifer, the, the, our enemy, is very similar to the roaring lion, and, and, it, and it gives us an aspect of how to fight him. All right, so let's get into it. Uh, Luke, Luke, Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Luke chapter 10, verse 19, Jesus says, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. This is a very important passage of Scripture because it tells us two things. Number one, it tells us that we have an enemy, a definite enemy, and that we have authority over that enemy. John 10.10. 10. In the Gospel of John, these first nine verses, Jesus is talking about um, preachers and spiritual leaders that are fake and phony and fraud. The thief of John 10.10 10 is actually a person like a false preacher who does evil things. The power behind that has always been determined to be Satan. And many people read this passage of scripture and think that the thief is Satan. And he is in essence because it is his nature. It is, his, it, it is him uh, behind this type of, uh, of, of, of issue. Look at what it says. The thief does not come except to kill, to, to steal, and to destroy. And I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So what does this tell us about our enemy? It tells us that our enemy is pure evil. It, there is nothing good in our enemy whatsoever. And that his intention for us is only evil. The only thing he wants is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So that's the purpose of the enemy. Then 1 Peter 5, verse 8 and 9, here's the passage that talks about the roaring lion. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 
resist him steadfast in the faith. Yeah. That's the only reason I put verse nine in there because I just wanted you to see what, what Peter said you're supposed to do. Resist him steadfast in the faith and just remember that uh, you're not suffering anything that other brother, Christian brothers in the world hadn't suffered. That's really what that's talking about. But, but Peter uses the analogy of a roaring lion. And Peter tells us, all right, guys, be vigilant. Um, be sober, be on alert, pay attention. Know what's going on around you because <clears throat> you have an enemy that's prowling around your life like a roaring lion and he's looking for someone who he made his vower. Yeah. Now I've mentioned this may to you before but it really comes into play here really well. I want you to notice this. This passage says that, that, that he's looking for someone whom he may devour. Now it, that doesn't say he can devour. If it, if it meant, if, if, he, if it was word can, it would just simply have to do with whether he has the ability to do it or not. But when he use, use may, may is a permissive word. May means you're asking permission. And so what this passage is saying is that Satan is constantly prowling around, invading territory, stalking people, looking for someone who will give him the permission to destroy their life. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking the same thing I'm thinking. Who in the world would give Satan permission to destroy their life? Well, I will just remind you that in that Gallup poll that I've quoted almost every week, and it's in your notes, that Gallup polled Christians that call themselves Christians and said, do you believe in a literal, real, personal devil? And 60%, 59% actually to be, yeah, to be, yeah. to be precise, 59% of those people said, we do not believe in a literal devil. We do not believe in a real devil that actually comes against our life in a personal way. We believe that when the Bible uses the word devil, it's just talking about general evil in general. It's just, in other words, Satan's just a figurehead when you talk about evil things, wicked things in the earth. Now, I submit to you that these people are easy prey for the roaring lion because people that aren't even aware that there is an enemy prowling around their life certainly are not going to be prepared for not only an enemy, but an enemy that has bad intentions to be stalking their life. They're not prepared at all. They're not ready. There are two traits that Peter uses here in 1 Peter 5. That, that he says, these are, these are two traits that protect us from the roaring lion. Now notice what these two traits are. Number one, be sober. Be sober just simply means be under control. Now what Peter's talking about here is not talking about, he's not talking about legalism. In other words, he's not saying to you, look, you know what the Lord intends for you to do? The Lord intends for you to live a life you have no fun whatsoever in. The Lord doesn't want you to have any spontaneity in life. He doesn't want you to have any joy in life, any enthusiasm in life. Just live this tight, buttoned-up life that is completely under control because if you don't, the roaring lion's going to get you. No, he's not talking about legalism. He's not talking about living a life where there's no fun and no, and no spontaneity at all. What he's talking about is, look, we have every right to live an abundant life, but our abundant life has to be under control. Because any area of our life that gets out of control, it's open to the roaring lion in our life. So the first trait that protects us is to be sober. Hey guys, be under control. The second trait that Peter says will protect us is to be vigilant. To be vigilant means to be aware or to be watchful. To, be, to, to, to know what's going on around you, to pay attention. And, 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 the, and, the, and the context is, all right, you pay attention to what's going on around you just as you would if you went into enemy territory and there was an enemy that you thought could attack you at any moment. You didn't know where they were, you didn't know when they were going to attack, but you were in their territory and you believed they could attack at any moment. In other words, pay attention to what's going on around you. I mean, listen, do any of you guys remember what our country was like before 9-11? You know, September the 11th, 2001, by the way, a long time ago, right? Some of you precious people, young ones, teenagers, you weren't even born yet. But our country used to be completely different before 9-11, right? Uh, we weren't aware, 
so to speak, that there was an enemy out there that hated us simply for being Americans and being free and that they were trying to kill us, although they had, ta had, a, had been attacking us for about 10 years. I don't know if you guys are aware of that or not. They attacked the World Trade Tower in 1993, the Marine Barracks in Saudi Arabia in 1996, the U.S. Embassy in Kenya in 1998, and the USS Cole in 2000. They gave us plenty of warning, in other words, what I'm saying. Plenty of warning. We're out to get you. We're trying to kill you. We're going to take over. But we were naive, weren't we? We weren't paying attention. We didn't take it seriously. We went on airplanes with everything, right? The cockpits on the airplane, the pilots, where the pilots fly the plane, they were always open, right? You could, when you boarded the plane, you could look in and you could see all the instrumentation and the pilots and everything. I mean, and during the flight, if you went to the front of the plane, you could just see right into the cockpit and everything. And, uh, just as, uh, and we weren't prepared for anything because we had no idea that we needed to be prepared. But here what Peter is saying is, look, Peter's saying you need to be aware, just like right now, we are far more aware of the fact that there is an enemy out there that hates us and calls us the big Satan for nothing other than living the life of freedom and being what God created us to be and that we have to protect ourselves against people who, who are trying to harm us and do evil against us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything's changed, right? Right? Our whole attitude, our whole opinion, the way we handle ourselves, what we take on the airplanes, we, work, we go through metal scanners. What is all that about? That's about being aware. That's about paying attention. That's about knowing what's going on around you. And Peter says, look, you have an adversary out there that is ro roaming around just looking for an opportunity to take advantage of you. So you have to be aware. And he says he's very personal because notice what it says. Well, it, I don't have that verse up there, but I'll quote it. Be, be sober, be vigilant. It's the same verse. Be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the devil, is Roman. He's your adversary. He's personal. He's watching you. In other words, he is your enemy whether you want him to be or not. Whether you consider yourself his enemy doesn't matter to him. He, he considers himself your enemy. Yeah. And, so, and so Peter says, all right, be aware. Now, after he tells us two things that will help us fight against the enemy, we're to be sober, pay attention, be careful, be vigilant, be, you know, see what's going on around you. Now he gives us three reasons why we should do so in the same verse. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Number one, number one reason why you should be vigilant and sober. The enemy is adversarial toward us. In other words, he, he moves against us whether we move against him or not. He's not waiting for us to attack him. He attacks us. Now, we have many Christians that are really naive about the devil, really. And somehow their idea might be, and, and I don't know if anybody sitting in this room might be thinking this, but you know, uh, when I say, you have an adversary and he's after you and you're going, I'm so nice, pastor, I'm like you. I'm just the sweetest person in the world. Because we all know how sweet I am. <laughs> but but uh, it doesn't matter how, you know, you know what being sweet and nice does to the devil? It just makes him matter. Mm -hmm. He hates sweet people. Yeah. He hates nice people. Well, pastor, I just cook, make cookies and take them down to the nursing home. Well, he hates you and your cookies. <laughs> he would rather you be sending a, 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 an envelope bomb down there to the nursing home. He's evil and he's your adversary and, 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 and he's your personal adversary and he wants to destroy your life. Second reason why you should be sober and vigilant, the enemy is active in his efforts to find a way to destroy you. Be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the devil, what does it say next? Walks about like a roaring lion. In other words, he's not waiting for you to stumble into his territory. He's walking into your territory, looking for you. 
He is aggressive. He's active. He's not sitting around waiting for you to do something. He's prowling around in your territory. He's stalking you. You know what he's trying to do? He's trying to intimidate you. He's trying to make you nervous. So you'll make a mistake. So you'll, so you'll, so it'll create some panic in you and maybe you'll respond in the wrong way and maybe it'll be sin and what that sin, when sin happens in your life, it opens up a door for him to jump in to that area of your life and see, that's what he's hoping to do. So he's not, he's not waiting for you, he's after you. We should be sober and vigilant because man, he's an adversary, he's our adversary and he's roaming around right now trying to find a way into your life. And here's the third reason. The enemy's appetite is for total destruction. Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion. What's he doing? Seeking those he may snack on. Seeking those he may lick. No. What's he trying to do? What does he want to do? He wants to devour you. He's not a snacker or a licker. I put that in the notes. I said, I said, that sounds funny. Satan is not a snacker or a licker. He'll devour you. He's not your friend. He's not your pet. He's not your buddy. He is a ravenous beast. And, say, and Peter says, look, please take this seriously. Peter's saying, please take this seriously. Pay attention to this. Be on guard because you have an enemy that will devour your children, that will devour your spy, spouse, that will devour your health, that will devour your finances, that will devour everything that is good and, and personal to you. He's out to destroy. Now, that doesn't mean we need to fear him because... God has given us total authority over him. Do you see what this verse says? Don't be afraid. He, he's, not, he's not even going to be able to hurt you. Satan is a defanged, roaring lion. He has no authority over us. He can't hurt us. Jesus has given us all authority over our enemy, but we do have to pay attention and understand him. So I want to teach you a few things I've learned over the past three weeks or so about lions. And we're going to look at it as how it relates to the devil. Because Peter said that the devil is like a lion. So whatever characteristics a lion has, Peter says, hey, look at that, and that, you'll know how he's going to come against you. Now, I'm not an expert. I know some of you are sitting there going, well, Pastor, are you an expert on lions? No. No, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> some of you that never watched TV, y'all don't even know what that means, but... That's commercial. Yeah. You guys know on, online. Yeah, you watch TV all the time. <laughs> so I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I really have done. Listen, I, I love documentaries. I love wildlife documentaries, all that kind of stuff. So I've had a good time watching all that kind of stuff. So let me tell you what I've learned about the roaring lion, about how he's our enemy and how you can live your life safely in lion land, which is where we're living now. He's roaming in our territory, guys. He's after us. He's aggressive, he's active, but you can live your life safely and you can overcome him if you understand how he works and you pay attention to what's going on. So let me give you three truths about roaring lions. Number one, lions are nocturnal. Nocturnal means they hunt at night. <laughs> they prowl at night. Any of you that have house cats know the same tendency is true about house cats. They just, they, at night, they're very active. So to be safe in lion country, the first thing you must learn is that in the daylight, you're safe. After dark, you are not safe. <laughs> daylight, say this with me. Daylight is my friend. Daylight is my friend. Oh, daylight is my friend. There you go. My Lord. <laughs> During... During the, <laughs> all right, during the day, you can find lions. But when you find them, most likely, they're going to be in their, it's called, their, their herd is called a pride. You're going to find them in a pride. They're going to be about 15 to 20 lions. There'll be about three males in there and the rest are females. Females do all the work hunting and so forth. Males just, males just growl around and roar and protect the territory. But they're going to be laying there in the daytime and they're going to be asleep most of the time 
I mean, they even sleep on their backs with all four legs up, seriously. Reminds me of my, my boxer, Jake. And, and, and they sleep 18 to 20 hours a day. That's amazing. <laughs> but anyway, so, so during the day, you, you're gonna find them, they're asleep, but at night they're very active. And this is when they do most of their hunting and they will take advantage of every situation to gain stealth on their prey. One of the guys, just to give you an example, one of the guys said that uh, at, dusk, at dusk dark, you know, they begin to come, become very active because they're, they're hunting for feed, for food. And he said they would be driving their Land Rover down this little path going down through there. And there would be like a herd of Cape Buffalo over here on the left or a, Cape, uh, uh, a herd of gazelle or some, some, something lions feed off of. And the next thing you know, you'd look beside you on the right side of that a Land Rover, and there would be a pride of lions running beside that Land Rover all the way down, using the Land Rover as stealth to, to attack them so they can't see them, and they're not paying attention to this Land Rover, but there's a pride of lion on the other side, and as soon as they get past, bah! And I said, man, that is just unbelievable. That is, that, that, that's just a crafty way of handling things. So, lesson number one, okay. lesson number one, about the roaring lion is, it's dangerous at night. Darkness is his domain. I'll give you one other story. One of, the, one of the couples were with a group of other people that they were friends with on a safari. And they took them and they put them out in these little bungalows, like eight or 10 bungalows around, and there was a lodge right down here about 50 feet away. The lodge was where they ate dinner and they met up and strategized about where they were going the next day, blah, 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 all that. They did all their stuff in the, in the lodge down there, but they all had individual couples, individual couples had their own bungalows around, like little motel rooms. Well, they got back from, from a nature walk um, and it was almost dark. And so the guide says, all right, you guys go in there and, you know, take a shower, get dressed, get ready for dinner. And uh, I'm going to go down here to the lodge and we're going to prepare dinner for you. Now, here's what I'm telling you. When you, get, when you get ready to come to the lodge, you stay in your bungalow. Do not come out of your bungalow. A guide will come and get you when it's time to come down to the lodge. So, so the guy that was telling the story said, you know, he said, man, I, we got ready, got in, in about 30 minutes, got dressed, got a bath, all that. And he said, man, I was starving to death. He said, man, I was just famished. And he said, so I started pacing around, you know, about 30 minutes. And he, he, said, he said, I walked over to the door and I pulled the little flap up and I looked out the window and he said, you could see the lodge. It was about 50, about 50 feet, maybe 50, 20, 30 yards right down there. You could see it easy. It was lit up, everything. And he, he said, I turned around to my wife and I said, um, honey, I don't, you know, it's been about 45 minutes now. He said, uh, and I'm starving to death. And he said, I can look out this window and I can see the lodge right down there. There's a light. He said, well, I think we need to just go on down there. And she said, honey, no. She said, what did they tell you? They said, do not leave your bungalow and we will come and get you. And so he said, all right, all right. And then he walked, paced around about another 15, 20 minutes. He looks out there, he sees the, see, looks out there, he sees the lodge down there. He turns around and he said, I, do you think they forgot us? I mean, they just, uh, does it take that long to get that lodge prepared, blah, blah, blah. And then finally, a few more minutes later, the, the, the guide knocks on the door, gets them, takes them down to the lodge. When they get down to the lodge, the, the guide looks at them and, and says, look guys, I, I, am, I am so sorry I apologize um, for being so late in coming to get you for dinner. But we had to wait for that leopard that was outside your door to leave. And he said, hello, <laughs> message received. <laughs> I never saw a leopard out there. If I'd have stepped out that door, that leopard would have eaten me alive. They hunt at night. Lesson number one. Stay out of the darkness. Mm -hmm. Darkness is the domain of the devil. Mm -hmm. He is called the prince of darkness. You can't cast the devil out of his own property. Mm -hmm. It is the property of, sin is the property of Satan. Mm -hmm. Darkness is the domain of Satan. Mm -hmm. 
You can't cast him out of his own property. And so the, the way we have to handle that is we have to stay away from the darkness. Listen to these verses in Ephesians 5. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is, is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly and not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So our number one lesson about lines is stay out of darkness and you will be safe. Mm -hmm. Stay in the light. Mm -hmm. Look, we all make mistakes. We all, we're humans. We make mistakes. We sin against God. That's why we need a Savior. But when you do make a mistake, when you do sin, as quickly as you possibly can, yeah. deal with that sin. Take it to God. Repent. Get out of the darkness. The lion's out in the darkness. The leopards are out in the darkness. They're prowling around to take advantage of you. So you must get out of the darkness as quickly as possible. Handle it as quickly as possible and then get back in the light because the light is your friend. Yeah. Number two characteristic of a lion. Lions are perivisional. All right? Now, I know perivisual, you go, what in the world is that? You're trying to show us you went to college, right? Uh, <laughs> I don't really think there's such a word as perivisional, actually. I made that word up. Uh, I, 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 I combined a couple of words. You know, visual, visual means to see, right? Yeah. All right, I typed in a word search on a uh, uh, sea, sea surrounding area. Because that's the only, I mean, that's, that's what I'm trying to describe. And it brought up a medical term, peri, a prefix, peri, which means the surrounding area, the area around, like, at like the area around a wound. So it, it, what, I'm, what I'm describing here is, I'm trying to tell you that lions don't see like we see. That when lions look at something, they, they don't just see one little individual something. They see the, they see the whole unit as one. Uh, let, me just, let me see if I can make it clearer. Because this is really a good point. <laughs> let, me see if I can, let me see if I can make it a, a little clearer. All right, how many of you have ever watched uh, uh, documentaries, you've watched the Discovery Channel, uh, Animal Planet, uh, any of those, and you've seen documentaries of grassland animals and so forth, and, and uh, you've, you've seen these, uh, these men or the crew, it could be women and men, and they might have cameras or they might have guns, what, depends on what they want to do on their, on what, uh, on their, uh, their adventure here. But th they all load into like a Jeep, the back of a Jeep. It doesn't have any sides. It doesn't have a top. Has no protection whatsoever. It's just, they just jump up in the back and they're all sitting on the edge of the Jeep and there might be six or eight of them and somebody's going down the road or they're in a Land Rover and they're just sitting on some benches that are in that Land Rover and they're just wide open and exposed. And they're going down and as they go down the little path there, the little trail there, you, you know, you're seeing, you're seeing wildlife all over the place. You, you know, you see elephants and giraffes and you see birds and you see, you know, gazelle over there and you see cape buffalo and all that. And then, and then they, what they're looking for is, are the big cats. And, they, and then when they get to, they, they find some out there, maybe old scraggly tree or something, and, and they look and they see a bunch of lions out there and they turn and they go that, that way. They go right over there. And, and now they're in a vehicle that doesn't have any protection. They're not behind glass walls with a top and all that. They're just wide open sides. Now, have you wondered? I have. What kind of idiots are these people? I'm thinking they're going right, and they go right out there to them. 
I mean, these, these cats might be, um, there, there might be a half chew, uh, chewed up carcass laying there and some of the cubs and some of the others are, are kind of chewing and munching on it and all that and these other ones are just laying around and, 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 and you, they drive up in this Jeep and the lions don't even act like they see them. They don't even, they don't, they don't respond to them in any way. And I'm going, why is that? Well, the fact is, they don't see them. Not like you and I see them. What they see is they see one big unit. When they drive up in that Jeep or that Land Rover, what a lion sees, he doesn't see a bunch of individual humans inside of a big vehicle. What the lion sees is just all one big unit. Everything, everything's the same. And what the lion is thinking is, that's too big for me to kill. It doesn't even smell like anything I, I would want to eat. And they're not trying to take my food away from me. So frankly, they don't care. They have no concern whatsoever and they can drive up within four or five feet and just, lions don't even move, don't even budge. Now, if you, as an individual, step out of that truck, <laughs> all of a sudden now, you are responsible for your own profile. In other words, you have established a new profile. Instead of one big unit right over here, now you stepped out, and now you got like, uh-oh, my, my profile is separated from that profile, and now they do want this profile, and they will kill you and probably eat you right there in front of their friends. So what am I saying? I'm saying that in, with lions, you have to stay with the truck. If you step out of the truck, you're gone. Now, I'm sure you're ahead of me on this analogy. Let's lay this down for us, all right? What does this mean about the devil and the roaring lion and us? All right? This church building full, is filled with God's people, right? You, we all here, we're worshiping in Jesus' name. Uh, Jesus is in the midst of us. This right here is the truck. So we're safe in the truck. The enemy is not going to attack the truck with all of the people in it. Let me give you a verse. Matthew verse eight, chapter 18, verse 19 and 20. Look at what it says. Again, this is Jesus talking. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Where two or three are gathered in my name. What does that mean? Well, it's talking about committed Christian fellowship. What does it mean to be in committed Christian fellowship. It means that I have friends or I have a wife or a husband or a family. I have people I hang with that are committed to Christ just like me. And when we are together, whether we're actually talking about Jesus or not, we are committed Christians in relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we are together, Jesus said, where two or three of you are gathered together, I am in the midst of you. So two could be a husband and wife. You see, God made it so easy for us. He said, just get one other person. Get your wife, get your husband. Uh, get your kids, get your family. Uh, you and a family friend. Uh, you and, 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 and another Christian believer, you know, that you're just hanging with. So, so what he's describing now, he's describing a committed fellowship with another Christian, and he's describing a, a, a connection of accountability with another believer so that I am not a lone ranger in this world. This is what he's talking about. He said, get with at least one more believer, and when you do, I'm coming into the midst of you. 
I, I'm going to be there. I'm, gonna, I'm in there. I, I, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to walk right there with you. Now, I know some people say, well, why did God's with us all the time? And you're exactly right. He is always with us. He says, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. So he's always there. So why does he promise to be there when two or three are gathered together? Because he doesn't want us to be alone. He's trying to encourage us to be together. He says, you're powerful together. You're strong together. You're accountable to each other together. And when you get together, I'm telling you, I'm going to be there right with you. All right, now, let's put this in a scenario and show you what it means about the roaring lion. All right? All right? You're on your way to meet with one of your Christian friends. The devil has had a bad day. He's roaming around looking for somebody that he may devour. He looks at you. And let's just say that you kinda, you, you kinda scrawny. You're not very powerful looking. And uh, you're not very intimidating looking. And so he looks you over and he concludes, I think I have just found someone that I can devour. And about that time, you meet up with your Christian friend. And you guys begin discussing whatever you're interested in and comparing something that Jesus said or you prayed about or in some way you bring Jesus into what's going on. Well, all of a sudden, something happens quite unseen to you, but definitely not missed by the enemy. Jesus is a spirit. I mean, he's in this room right now, but we can't see him because he's spirit. We can sense him. We know by faith that he's here, but we can't see him because we're not in the spirit realm. Well, the roaring lion is in the spirit realm. And the roaring lion can see in the spirit realm. And when you met your friend, that roaring lion was prowling around you, looking for that advantage to devour you. And when you met up with that friend and you guys had that committed Christian fellowship, all of a sudden, Jesus shows up in the midst of you. And that lion begins to tremble. That lion begins to shake, breathe hard, sweat and runs as fast as he can away from there. You know why? Jesus is too big to kill. He doesn't see us anymore. He sees all of us. He sees not two individual people that he might take advantage of, but big old Jesus now has appeared into the scene. He's already whipped him up once. He'd be glad to do it again, and the roaring lion runs away because of the presence of Jesus there. And Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Which means that anytime you're with another Christian believer, I'm not talking, or a friend who is a Christian, not somebody that doesn't know the Lord, but, but if, if you look, if you're with somebody who doesn't know the Lord, you guys are setting your own profile. You've just stepped out of the Jeep. You've just given the roaring lion the opportunity he needs. But when you're gathered together in the Lord, the Lord sets the profile. And he's way too big for the devil and way too powerful. Jesus is here right now. The devil would never attack a place like this. Would never attack a group like this. Especially when Jesus is right there with them because we're way too big to kill. You are safe when you are in Christian fellowship, but when you get off by yourself, the devil loves the lone sheep. How many of you have watched when lions are hunting? I, I watched a video a few years ago. It was a little baby Cape buffalo, 
And the little, and the little baby had been, uh, the, there, were, there were lions out hunting, and the, and the lion grabbed the little baby, and the little baby kind of staggered off by itself, and that lion grabbed that baby and started running and went down kind of by the water, and it was the most amazing thing you've ever seen. Uh, an alligator jumped out of the water and grabbed the little baby, and it was a, it was a tug of war between the lion and the, and the alligator. Oh, who was going to get the little baby? Well, the lion won, pulled the little baby back, Carrying it in its mouth. Now it had just been carrying it by by its skin, like you know, like cats do their kittens, and and so a little fella hanging there, and all of a sudden, I'm serious. Now go go home, type it in YouTube, whatever you'll see it. Uh, put uh, gate, Cape buffaloes protect young, and whenever that lion turns around, that herd of Cape buffalo. These uh, Cape buffalo are about six feet tall, guys. I'm six feet tall. Uh, but that Cape buffalo is about my height. That's how big they are. And man, that, that, that herd, lions don't attack herds, is what I'm saying to you. Herds are bad news. And, and man, those Cape buffalo, it was about 15 of them, 20, lined up, big males, had their horns down, and they just walking toward that lion, just like that. That lion looked up and saw that herd, that, that line of, of, of Cape buffaloes coming at him, and he dropped that little one and took off running, and the Cape Buffaloes took off after him and hit him and knocked him all up in the air and threw him all over the place. And the, little, and the mama Cape Buffaloes came and got the little baby Cape Buffalo. Man, it was the most amazing thing you've ever seen. Well, lions know this. That's why they don't attack herds. But what they do is they lie down and wait, and they jump up, and they try to spook a herd. They try to scare them, you know, frighten them, so that hopefully a little one or a sick one will, 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 will veer, veer out away from the herd, and when he does, that's lunch. That's what the devil does with us, guys. He loves us to, be, to, to get out of committed Christian fellowship. What does that have to do with anything? Well, I'm going to tell you. What that means is, what kind of friends do you have? That's what I'm asking you. See, you, you, you in here, he's not going to attack you in here. Jesus is in here. We way too big. He's not going to attack the herd. You walk out there, you get in your automobile, you, you call your friend, you stop over there at Wendy's or McDonald's or Berkey, whatever you go to. They don't know the Lord. They're lost as a goose. You know what you did? You've just set your own profile. And that friend, that fellowship like that ain't going to work. This world is too evil, too deadly, and too destructive for us to leave ourselves wide open for enemy attack. He's prowling around, guys. He's aggressive. He's not waiting for you to go, well, I think I'll go over there to that uh, dope dealer's house and get in there. No, he's roaming around in your living room, in your backyard. He's looking for you to, 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 to devour you if he possibly can. So you need Christian, committed Christian fellowship. You don't need to be around people that are not, that don't know the Lord. Here's what you say. All right, if your friends don't know the Lord, here's what you say. Hey, Bob, hey, look, I'm a Christian and, and, and I'm going to serve the Lord and I want you to go with me. Will you, will you go with me? And if Bob says, yeah, okay, then you want a brother. If Bob says no, then say, well, Bob, I tell you this, last time I see you. And go find you some Christian friends. Because if you don't, you're not going to, I mean, you're, you're wide open. I'm just, that's all I'm saying to you. I'm telling you that roaring lions love long sheep. So if you want to be devoured, go ahead. Number three, third trait. Y'all good still? All right. This is the last one, by the way, okay? <laughs> Here's the last one. Lions are territorial. Territorial. Everything in the wild is about territory. Every wild animal is about territory. Lions are about territory. What are you saying, Pastor? Well, I'm saying to you that um, what happens if you walk up to a lion or you happen to stumble on a lion out in the wild? Let's just say you by yourself, you walk up on one and there's a lion. What you gonna do? Well, I don't know what you're gonna do. 
then better start praying. But, but one thing that you definitely don't do, and you've heard this about other wild animals, you do not run. You know why you do not run? Because if you take, now that lion is going to do something to try to intimidate you. They're going to make a, what's called a territorial display. They're going to try to it, intimidate you. The roar, a lion's roar is an intimidation factor. He's trying to scare you. He's trying to make you afraid. Uh, I'll give you a story real quick. Uh, this group that one was describing, they were about five or six of them, and the guide said, you want to go on a nature walk? They said, yeah. And they got out there on the nature walk, and they looked, and the guide, the guide didn't have a gun. And he said, and one of the guys said, hey, you, you don't have a gun. He said, oh, I don't need one. And so the guy said, well, I started praying right then because he said, man, I'm out here with some mentally ill guy who doesn't think he needs a gun in lion country. And the guy said, no, you don't need a gun. He said, well, I think you need to get a gun. He said, no, you guys will be fine. Just stay with me. Just, you just stay with me. And so they were walking down and, and they kind of got to a little opening, a little road like where, where the, the vehicles had gone down and about 50 yards down there, there was a, a bachelor bull elephant. Now, a bachelor bull elephant is a bull elephant that's gotten kicked out of the herd. So he's mad. And it's mating season, so he's got a, he's got a stream of musk flowing down, coming out of his head up here, flowing down his, 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 his snout. So that makes him extra mad. And he looks at them, and that guy said, he began to swag his head like that and began to scream like, Wah! You know, just screaming. And he said, man, we looked at him, and the guy said, get, get behind me. And he, they got in a single file line behind the guide, six people right straight behind the guide. And, sh and man, that elephant came charging. And he said, that elephant got about 25 yards from him, and that guide went. And that elephant stopped. And then he looked at him again, and he wagged his head. Blew. Here he comes again. That guy stood there, and he said he got about 15 yards from him, and the guy went. And the elephant just turned and walked off into the bush. What was that? You know what? That, that was about territory. What happens if you run is you tell the animal that you are afraid of them and that you are not going to fight for your territory. You're not going to stand on your square, Lawrence. You are telling them by running away from them that they can have your territory if they will kill you, and which they will oblige. Uh, and they will kill you and take your territory. Well, the purpose of the lion's roar is to make you afraid. It is a territorial display in order to make you run away and hide in fear. Second Timothy chapter one, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. For God, all right, I'm, I'm gonna read it the way it, you should read it. I'm gonna read it the way you should read it. Here's how you should read it. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. In other words, you have a spirit of fear. It didn't come from God. God does not give us fear. We are not, there are only two things, two types of fears we're born with, the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. Mm -hmm. That's the only two fears that we're born with. Every other fear is a learned fear. It's a fear that's been placed in us by the enemy in order to take advantage of us. It's kind of interesting though, isn't it? The only, the only fear we're born with is the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. And so what do we do to little ones? Hey, buddy, hey! <laughs> I just thought y'all might want to know that. Notice that <laughs> next time. Hey, listen, this, I, this last little section right here is way too good to just run through. And I'm, I'm intimidated by that clock. Uh, I feel rushed. So I'm going to stop. So let me stop. <laughs> let me stop. Let me stop. Because, man, this last little part by itself is just wonderful. It's really important. It's about your promised land. Or would you be interested in that? It's about your promised land. God has given you a promised land. When you were birthed, when you were placed in your mother's womb, when you were conceived, God gave you a destiny. 
is your promised land. The devil doesn't want you to, to, to live on your promised land. Every time you get close to it, here comes a roaring lion. Roar, trying to roar, all, roar you off a of promised land. I mean, this is good. Okay, so you'll have a short sermon next week, okay? It'll be short. It'll be short next week. Oh, it'll be short. <laughs> it'll be short. I'm not going to watch any more videos this week. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be short. Okay, all right. All right, bow your head.